Well, for those that don't know, Nate Robertson spent the part of nine seasons in the major leagues, primarily with the Detroit Tigers. He's a native Wichita and also a star from Mace High School, and he also was a pitcher for the Wichita State, uh, Wichita State University. He was drafted in the fifth round of the 1999 uh, Major League Draft by the Florida Marlins. He's now part owner and the current president of Wichita Wingnuts, and um, also he, is, uh, he recently just took on the role as president of the organization. So outside of the baseball arena, um, Nate actually has a little bit of, uh, of an entrepreneurial spirit himself with uh, being the co-owner of the Candle Club, and he also is um, involved in several nonprofits with the Fellowship of Christian Athletes and also the Wesley Children's Foundation. So let's put our hands together for Nate Robertson. Well, Nate, thank you very much for joining us on the Startup Run stage. We appreciate you coming out and uh, sharing your story with us. So um, I, I've read a little bit about your biography before we got here, and everybody knows about your baseball history, but no one knows a lot about your childhood. So um, I know that you're one of four boys, and so um, tell us a little bit about how that was just, uh, how that was in your childhood and what that meant for you. I was hoping you weren't saying how the boys happen. Um, <laughs> Mom and Dad did a good job. Uh, no, uh, yeah, I'm born and raised in Wichita. Um, actually, uh, my first childhood home was 17th and Waco, right down the street. And uh, I was there until I was in the second grade. Uh, moved out to Northwest Wichita, went to Mays High School. Um, but the dynamic of having three brothers, and there was three of us that grew up together uh, close in age. And then there was the, the oopsie. My youngest brother, Matt, came along 12 years after I did. Um, and lo and behold... Uh, I'm 40 years old, and I'm going to have a baby in June, too, so hey. <laughs> Woo! It happens, right? Um, but yeah, just, uh, you know, uh, the one thing about my brothers, uh, you know, growing up, we had, a, we had a father and mother who poured into us. Uh, we didn't have a whole lot. Uh, first home, like I said, at 17th and Waco was less than 1,000 square feet, but we, uh, we thought we were rich, and that was kind of a cool deal. Um, my dad... You know, he, he was kind of a, a stink growing up, and he wanted to make sure that me and my brothers didn't grow up the same way he did. And so he, uh, one of the best things that happened to him was he enlisted in the Army, um, and he was a master sergeant, a uh, very you know, disciplinarian father, uh, challenged us, uh, instilled those values in us, and we challenged each other. We got in a few fights, but you know what? That's what happens, and if we were ever in trouble, uh, you, ever, you, knew, you, know, you knew who was in your corner. Uh, so that was really just... Um, you know, making sure that we were in church on Sundays, that was big. Um, understanding, uh, you know, there were a lot of the principles you guys operate by. I turned to you and I said, man, that sounds like the Bible you guys are preaching up here. Uh, you know, the foundation of the startup grind. And, you know, I loved what you said about making the friends and not contacts and, and giving. And that's, that's huge. Uh, one of the first things my dad taught me, and it, and it applies uh, to everything that I do, um, is, is giving. He taught us how to give. And if, that's the, one of the best lessons you can, you can teach your kids. As they grow up, they learn how to give, and the giver's a getter. And he, he started these, these values at a very young age, and he taught us. We got, went out and made woodcrafts for presents for our, for our family. And so that, that kind of mindset and that kind of heart for people to give first, you'll, you'll find a lot of success comes if, you're, if you learn how to give first. So that was kind of, you know, that was the foundation of who we were. So what kind of kid were you when you were growing up? I was actually the good one, man. I, my, I'm serious. I, I never got in trouble, and if I, if I was, like, on the brink of trouble, I knew how to, like, get, get uh, in a good light, if you will. Um, you know, Josh, Josh was kind of, uh, he was the fullback. You know, he led, led the way as the older brother, great older brother. My brother Luke, man, he was, he was, a, <laughs> he was my dad reincarnated growing up. And uh, then, then came the golden child, which is my youngest brother, Matt. But I, uh, you know, me, I just... Um, I actually found, I had, I had, I found it very difficult to fit in when I was young. Um, that was my biggest challenge, is try, you know, trying to fit in, and I was always trying to be something I wasn't. And so, you know, uh, as I went along and I started learning about character and about how to, how to treat others, um, it, it really formed my character. And once again, the foundation of how my dad brought us up, it really helped me in my interactions with people, my peers, and, uh, you know, now that I'm an old man, um, still doing it today. 
Well, so fast forward a little bit um, into uh, high school baseball. Uh, you, you chose Wichita State to go to school. Um, why'd, you cho why'd, you stay, why'd you choose to stay close to home? Well, that was easy. When I was uh, in, in 1989, when they won the World Series, uh, I would have been 12 years old, and I was in the family room at my parents' house, and I saw Greg Brummett strike out that last Texan. And uh, I knew right then, I was like, I want to go to Wichita State. And so, you know, baseball was in our family. Uh, my brothers were successful. Um, our, you know, our dad was our coach. We learned the game together. And once it came time, I was drafted out of high school, but I knew that, you know, there was no chance that, uh, you know, unless they paid me the money I was asking, uh, I wanted to go to school. And, and it was a good thing that I did because I had a couple major injuries at Wichita State that I, that I survived. But Wichita State, here was, here was my whole thing is that I, I learned what home felt like at a young age. And that's why I'm back here. You know, I, I got a wife from Florida, and I'm still teaching her about this being home now, <laughs> especially this time of year. Um, but uh, this is home, and this is why I moved back. Uh, Wichita State was definitely a place that I wanted to go. I was recruited but, uh, by other schools, but that's, that's why I made that decision. So when in your childhood you realized that you had a talent for baseball? Um, I think uh, when I was 10 years old, uh, I started kind of seeing where there was kind of a separating factor. There was teams asking me to play in their postseason tournaments at 10. And so I started to understand, okay, they're asking me to play because it's either they like me or I'm pretty good. And I didn't know if it was both. Maybe it was both. But, uh, you know, at a young age I knew. And then obviously when I got into high school when the scouts started showing up, uh, you know, the major league scouts were showing up and, and I knew that I had a, had a gift there. So what kind of pressure is that when you know a major league scout's there watching your high school baseball game? You know, I, I dealt with pressure really good. Um, I, I felt like, especially, we weren't really, my family wasn't like a brand name, you know, in the school system. We, we just were kind of just good old folks that were, you know, we just tried to do things the right way. We didn't always do that, but um, we, weren't, we weren't somebody's uh, cousin in the system or, you know, how that goes. And the politicalness of schools, as you probably all have experienced with your kids, or somebody at some point, uh, but you know, I, I think I was, I talked to you the other day, I was telling you a story, and this is a funny story. I like making fun of myself, or I like telling stories that make me sound funny or not so funny. Uh, I was in a, a social studies class, and my teacher was raving about this matchup between me and this other, this other pitcher, and the game was gonna be, it was Wellington, and if you guys don't know, Wellington had some baseball people too, the Cornejos, and so Jesse and I were gonna face off, and. And, you know, the teacher, it was, our, it was my teacher in Mays. And he was telling everybody how great this uh, pitching matchup was going to be. And he was like, man, you guys got to come out. Cause, and I thought he was going to sit there and start saying it. Because Nate, man, he's, doing, he's having a heck of a year. Well, he says, hey, you need to come out and see Jesse Cornejo pitch, man. This guy's unbelievable. And he can, go, he can go all sports and start anywhere he wants to. And I'm sitting there going, you know, what? And so what, what, what drove me with pressure, you know, this goes back to pressure, is that in those, in those big occasions, I felt like I could rise to them because I never, the one thing I didn't, and this applies to life in general and business, uh, my profession, is that I, I did not like when people compared me to anybody. And, and I've, I'm sure that everybody feels that same sentiment in this room, but when you compared me to somebody else, um, I was wanting to set myself apart. That was my thing. I want to set myself apart. I'm not like this person. And that's how, that was what drove me, and that's how I handled pressure. Yeah, and you mentioned in our conversation you guys play for Team USA while you were in college. Can you tell us about that? Well, obviously, in honor, um, I had, uh, you know, my freshman year, uh, Wichita State was the last year the Shocks went to the World Series. Um, that's unfortunate. We've got to change that. But uh, I broke my foot that year doing something stupid. Um, I actually told a big lie on how I did it, and it ended up being really bad. So, see, you know, the good kid, you know, the good kid here, not so good up here. Um, but, uh, you know, my sophomore year, I came back strong. I had a great year with the Eldorado Broncos. We won the World Series in the NBC, and Team USA called, and I had a chance to go pitch for them. And, uh, you know, what an honor to put that jersey on with USA. And in my first start, uh, I pitched against Nicaragua. Um, I was three innings deep, and I was throwing the ball well, but my velocity had dropped about, you know, 10 mile an hour. And they pulled me out of the game, and they asked me what was going on. I was like, well, my arm hurts. And they were like, well, it should. You're throwing 82. And so um, they sent me home, and I ended up going to L.A. and seeing Frank Job and I had Tommy John surgery, uh, which was one of those big, uh, you know, points of adversity in my life. 
which I learned a lot going through those times. But with Team USA, obviously, uh, in my one start, it was going pretty good. They actually gave me the win that game, so that was a, that was a good moment in my life. So you got to play in the NBC World Series with the LA Broncos. So talk about some pivotal points that were kind of your springboard, springboard into the uh, MLB. Well, those two summers, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, Wichita State, I was there four years, and I, I only pitched really one full season and then, like, most of another. So my, my biggest moments in college baseball were with the, with the Broncos. And in 96, it was kind of like a rebound opportunity. And, and uh, like I said, we won that. We ended up winning that game, and I was the winning pitcher. Um, I got hurt again when I blew my elbow out with Team USA, and so I had another year where I missed my junior year at Wichita State. And then that summer, I played with the Broncos again and again, with the Broncos, we went to the World Series championship game, and I was the winning pitcher there too. So that was really kind of like, that was my platform in college baseball. I had a really good year my last year at Wichita State, but those two summers um, got me re-exposed to the scouts. I mean, there was a lot of people that kind of abandoned what was going on with me, but those summertime uh, experiences helped me get back into the, into the, uh, the scope of Major League Baseball. So in, in 99 is when you, when you got the call um, to, to go to the big leagues, or you get to go to go play with the uh, Florida Marlins. Talk about that experience and what that felt like when you got that call. Uh, it was just, you know, it, it, you know I, I, I bring up uh, perseverance. You'll hear me say that several times, and it was just to get the phone call. Because I'd been drafted three times. It wasn't the draft like, that excited me any, anymore. It was just the fact that this draft meant something. This draft, they, were, they, wanted, you know, they, they wanted me. I finally you know, I had a shot at something, and I was healthy. And so you, know, you, you set your goals, and you never know how you stack up with the rest of the country, uh, the rest of the world at that point, you know, with international players. And it was just it was my chance. And so uh, to have a chance uh, with the Florida Marlins, um, not really the team I wanted to play for, uh, but it was an opportunity, and it ended up being a great start to a, a you know really fun career for me. So you talk about perseverance, and uh, do you, and you'd mentioned in a conversation we had uh, about some some rituals that you have before a game around perseverance. Um, can you talk a little about what 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 you do with uh, when you when it went up with with perseverance? Well, it was mostly. Um, and this goes back to, you know, just some of those biblical principles. You know, the book of James talks about perseverance and, and, a, and a work being complete in you. And as we talk about, you know, each, each individual's drive in life, you, like you, there's, there's a work being completed in each and every one of us if we accept that. So for me, you know, I knew that when I was tore down, I had to get built back up to become what I was supposed to be. And so the word persevere really stuck out. I put it under the bill of my cap. And... Whenever I got in those sticky moments in the game, you know, I had second, third with nobody out, and I had to get out of a jam, I always, I, I look up at the bill of my cap, and I just remembered, you know, what, what was the, what drove me to be where I was at, and how am I going to get through that, and it was persevere, you know, and it's, you know, it, it didn't work, it's not like it was like some little magic trick, and it worked all the time, but it kept, you know, it kept me grounded if, you know, good or bad, I was going to still get through it. And if I did get through it, well, I persevered. And if I didn't, I still had to persevere, you know what I'm saying? So we stuck with that concept, and uh, that, was, that was something that really you know, stayed with me throughout my career. So how long did you stay in the minor leagues? Uh, it was, it was short-lived. I had another major elbow surgery um, after my first year in minor league ball. Um, I, had my, I had two major elbow surgeries before I got an A-ball. So I wasn't really, I wasn't really a guy that, you know, I was a prospect, but I was kind of like damaged goods. And I talked to you about this, you know, it gets to that point as a player, as an athlete, um, y'all go milk shopping. I don't know who's lactose intolerant, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> I know if I go milk shopping and there's two jugs and I see two dates, well, I'm going to take the one that expires later. You know what I'm saying? So as an athlete, you know, it's really, you're looked at as not a milk jug. I mean, you shouldn't look, look like you should look more like a <laughs> martini glass, <laughs> but, um, I, you know, for, for me, uh, you know, and, and I'm kind of losing my, I know sometimes I do this, my partner over there, he was, he was jacking with me, J Judah Craig, how you doing, wave to everybody, Judah, <laughs> this is our brains behind the candle club over there, um, uh, but for me, it was, uh, you know, you, get, you have a short shelf life, and those, are, and those injuries, they were looking at those injuries, and they were saying, well, hey, he's either going to make it or he's done. And so for me, it's, you know, I had, to, I had to show up or, you know, you just you walk. Every, every year there's 50 new drafts, you know, and, and there's somebody behind you. That's what's so – it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world in professional athletes. I mean, the next year somebody's there to take your job. And so it's, uh, it's an achievement. I mean, it's an achievement to get to the big leagues. There's a lot of people that don't know this number. 
But um, and over the uh, over a hundred years of Major League Baseball, there's only been there's been less than 19,000 that ever made it, in over a hundred years. So it's a pretty impre- it's a pretty impressive number to get there. And then for ma- for Major, thank you. thank you. Now, most people use my baseball card for you know their 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 bike spokes. Is that is that what they used to do with baseball cards? My dad told me that you put hit, hit the, yeah the little clipping thing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an achievement and, um, you know, getting there's one thing, but staying there's even more. So what was that, the, when you made your first pitch for a big league team, what did that feel like? <laughs> well, you want to tell the experience before the first pitch or let's do the experience before the first oh, pitch. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So I was in double A. I had a good year. I'm driving home in the middle of the night. My wife now, fiance then we're coming in from Portland, Maine to go back to Wichita and uh, I didn't get, like, the initial wave of call-ups. I was disappointed, and I get a phone call, and it's late in the night. It's like, it's like 11-something at night, and the director of player development, and I, it, I didn't have good service, so it went to my voicemail. He said, call back anytime. Long story short, okay, it was a great moment. I get called up to the big leagues, and I'm, we're, like, between the West Virginia and Kentucky border. My wife, she continues driving to uh, Wichita. I stop in Lexington and take a flight to... New York and meet the team at Shea Stadium. And they, you know, the phone call was like, hey, where you at? I'm going home. How would you like to start in Pittsburgh on Saturday? That was, and so yeah, I'll be, I'm there. <laughs> so we get, to, we get to Pittsburgh and I go in the clubhouse and I wore contact lenses back then. And that was, you know, so I go in and I put my contacts in. I had some problems with contacts all the time. And this happened to be one of those moments. And it was pretty much the worst time it could ever happen, my major league debut. So I put them in, and they're burning my eyes out. And, I mean, they're making my eyes water, turn red, and I can't see. Well, you got to see when you look for the signs from the catcher, you know. He's... <laughs> so I'm like, I have no other choice. And the only th- other choice I had, I had these polo, these gold-rimmed polo reading glasses. So <laughs> on national TV, uh, my first start of my career... I'm out there, and I got these dorky looking. I mean, I look, I look. It was terrible. It was a terrible look. I, I'm like, I'm sure the hitters like were real intimidated by me up there on the on the mound. I pitched all right. We ended up losing the game, but um, just just to sit there and realize that I got there, it was it was a pretty, it was a real cool 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 moment. So, what's it like to pitch in front of fifty thousand fans? Um, you know, I always say this, and you ask me to speak, and I'm always reluctant. Uh, I don't really enjoy it at all. And so people say, well, what, what, how, do you, how can you not speak in front of, you know, a few hundred people or 50 people or a group of 10 people? Um, and you get all worked up about that, but you pitched in front of 50,000. And I said, you know what? When I'm pitching, I'm looking at the catcher. He gives me a sign. I look at the catcher. I'm still looking at the catcher. I throw my pitch. I'm looking at the catcher. I don't look at the 50,000 people in the stands. When I, when I speak... I've already looked at every one of you guys' faces, and you're looking right back at me, you see? And I'm a social anxiety kind of guy, so I, you know, I don't really do well with that. But f- yeah, I mean, there's, there's a difference between pitching at West Urban Little League and uh, Yankee Stadium, yeah. <laughs> Were they big fans of you at Yankee Stadium? Uh, they're only a big fan if you're getting your butt kicked, so. Yankee fans are special. Uh, I never, I haven't pitched in the the new one, uh, the new Yankee Stadium, but I heard that it lost its mystique there. Uh, old Yankee Stadium was it was a different place. And let me tell you, I pitched there and pitched there successfully uh, on a couple occasions, uh, and then we played there in '06. We made our World Series run, and I got I had Game One um, against Chiming Wong, who was having an incredible year. We were kind of floundering there at the end, but a Yankees, uh, you know. Yankees fans during the regular season and the Yankees fans during the playoffs are a whole nother ball game. And I mean, I'm telling you, these guys know every single thing about you. You go out there warming up in the bullpen and they're saying things and you just want to go up in the stands and rip them right on out. But you know what? Probably not a good idea. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a special environment. Um, I'll never forget it. And it was just, there was a different, and you know, going back to, I'm staring at my catcher and pitching. Though I could hear those fans. I mean, I could hear them in game one of the playoffs. But uh, it's, uh, it was just one of those neat experiences, though, too. I really appreciated having the chance to do that. Well, you were with the Tigers when they were in their downtimes, and then you were with them in their uptimes, too, as well. Talk about the difference between the two. 
Well, first of all, um, I got, uh, so I was a Marlin. I got my first call up with the Florida Marlins in 02. In January of 03, my, my Florida wife, okay, and her Florida family, and our Florida wedding, we got married January 10th of 2003 on a Friday night. Well, Saturday morning, I get a phone call. And it's the Tigers and it's the Marlins GM saying I got traded to Detroit. Had no idea what was happening. Um, this is the day after my wedding, guys. And my wife's from Florida. And I was a, and I was a Marlin, Florida Marlin. And we're going to Detroit. Uh, so I told my in-laws, my mother-in-law walked out of the room on me. Um, fast forward, the Marlins that year in 2003 won the World Series. And the Tigers that year lost 119 games. We were one short, we were one short of the all-time record. So as I was watching my buddies win the World Series and hoist the trophy there in New York, they beat the Yankees. They beat the Yankees, Judah. Um, I was sitting there licking my wounds after 119 losses. So, um, but the, the chance to play in Detroit, uh, that was really that was the best thing for my career, getting there, uh, the opportunity I had. Um, the run that we had, losing 119, three years later, we were in the World Series. We should have beat the Cardinals. I, I hope there's not Cardinals fans in here because I can't stand them. <laughs> you know, I never liked them anyway, but I hate Cardinals. And did I say I hated the Cardinals? <laughs> we, uh, we, we actually came three games short of winning the World Series. Um, we just stopped, we stopped playing well at the wrong time, at the wrong time, and um, you know, it's, uh, we lost four games to one, and, and it was still an amazing moment. I remember, I remember telling myself, I mean, like, I'm, so at the time I'm 29, and when you're a younger player uh, or you're coming into, you know, uh, that moment where, you know, you're establishing yourself, but you think that it's going to keep on going, I remember, like, we lost, and it was like, oh, we'll be back next year. You really don't realize how unbelievable that moment is and how special it is uh, when you're there. So I did make a point. I remember I pitched, I pitched uh, the first game in St. Louis. I had all the road starts. In that. I, played, I pitched in Oakland, in New York, and in St. Louis. I was like, thanks, Jim Leland. Appreciate it, man. I had no fan love. You know, all the fans hated me because I was on the other team. But it was, I stepped off the mound, and I soaked it in, and then I played ball. It was fun. So speaking of, speaking of Jim, Jim Leland, like what you've played for a lot of coaches throughout your career, who's been the most inspirational? It has to be him because he came in, um, we had 13 straight losing seasons in Detroit, and his first year we went to the World Series. And so, you know, a lot of times people don't realize how much managers make a difference. Um, and it's not necessarily the game and how you manage the game. I mean, he always said that the American League was easy to manage. He just said, I threw a lineup out there, and you, you see how far your starting pitcher goes. Whereas in National League, you got to kind of, you know, you got to change things around here and there. But the biggest thing with him was is that, you know, you talk about making friends, you know, not contacts. And the first time he came up to me, uh, we had a, we had a, a Tiger Fest. It's, you know, it's a fan appreciation thing before the season started. And Jim Leland came up to me, and he, he said, hey, how's Kristen doing? That's the first thing he said to me. I had never met him in my life, but he knew my wife's name. Now, whether or not he had the media guide and he was checking like right before he came and talked to me and saw Kristen's name, I don't, but he took the time to find out what her name was. And so immediately with me, like, and, and, and every player on that team, we saw somebody that wanted to engage in us. And when you get around people that engage in you, you'll, you'll do things for them, you know? And we didn't have the, we didn't have the best team, um, but, man, we, I tell you what, we had guys that were connected, and we played well. We, had, we, won, we won over 100 games that year. When I'd heard in a podcast recently that um, you quoted this, and it was, it was uh, people don't remember your numbers. They remember what type of teammate you were. Yeah. Yeah, that, and that's, that's something that we try to teach, you know, you know everywhere, really, um, whether it be with the Wing Nuts or the Candle Club. You know, it's about, you know, it's, it's about being a good teammate. Jim Leland really taught that, that concept of teammate. And I guarantee you right now, I, don't, I mean, if you can think of your favorite player ever in the big leagues, if you're a baseball fan, I would love for you to tell me what their final career stats were. And you probably can't do it. And my point with this is that nobody really remember. They, they might remember that you were a pretty good player or not. Um, and they'll definitely probably forget your numbers, but they will never forget how you treated them and the legacy that you had as a teammate. And so 
Um, that's something that, you know, that we try to do in our organization. We try to have good teammates. Um, you know, when we talk about business, we want to have partnerships. We don't want to have sponsorships, you know. And to have that idea, we want to have community that come. You know, that's the idea of all that. And if you think, you know, if it's just you got these goals and numbers that you're trying to hit, um, just be a good teammate. Well, and you're you're still a fan favorite in Detroit. Um, you know, you had a little uh, episode called Gun Time at one point in time, and I think there's still bobbleheads out there that talk about that. So, <laughs> can you share a little bit of insight on that? Well, so. You know, every team tries to have a, their rally cry. Uh, if you ever followed the Anaheim Angels, they had one of the most annoying ones. Has, if, if you guys have been to an Angels game ever in California, the Angels have, if they're behind this, they have this video that comes up, and it's a little monkey. And it's a live monkey, and he's got a towel, and he jumps, and he starts waving his towel. And I swear to you, every time the monkey comes out, they win. But so it's, it's, their, it's their rally monkey. And uh, so... We, in Detroit, we really didn't have a, like a rally cry, and, and, and it wasn't intentional, but there was a game, if you ever watch the games where you hear the players, the mics, whether it's the player or the umpire, you can hear, the, they're, hear what they're talking about in the dugout or on the field. Well, they came up to Kenny Rogers, he was next to me, the pitcher, um, and they asked Kenny if he'd do it, and Kenny's like old vet, and he looks over at me, he's like, let this young guy do it. I was like, well, I'm not going to say anything. So I throw on the mic for the game, and I told him, I was like, look, I'm pretty boring. I, you know what? I'm a pretty boring guy, so I don't, I'm not going to really give the home viewers much to see. So the game's going on. We're playing the Yankees. Why is it always about the Yankees? <laughs> we're playing the Yankees at home, and uh, so we're getting beat 5 nothing. and Pudge Rodriguez comes up to the plate, and I told the guys, I was like, look, it's, it's like I'll give you something we did in the Little Leagues. So it was actually something that was, it was given birth from over where I played at West Urban. We used to throw a wad of seeds or gum in our mouth for a rally, me and my teammates. I mean, I'm talking when I'm six years old. And so I started, I grabbed, there's a pack of Big League Chew there, and I threw this big wad of gum in my mouth. And right when I did it, they put the camera on me. And I explained what I was doing so the people at home could hear it on TV. And right when I do it, Pudge hits a home run. And so it was just TV magic. It was like just captured on, so I throw in the rally chew, he hits a homer, and then all of a sudden, I do it two or three more times in that game. We tied the game up late. And we ended up losing an extra innings, but the next day I pitched. And I came out, and there were signs all over the stadium. People that drew pictures of me with a wad of gum in my mouth. And so then it was like a thing that happened throughout the year. We, we had, I think we led the major leagues in comebacks that year. I mean, we were like that team. And everybody always wanted one of the gum. So then it was a deal where I'm sitting there during games throwing packs of gum up to the fans you know like in the seventh or eighth inning we were behind but it was kind of a goofy thing and I actually kind of shied away from it because it wasn't really I'm like oh god we gotta throw freaking gum in my mouth again and you know it, seriously I was like just is this thing gonna die but fans are fans you know and that was what was so cool about it is like I always told the people in Detroit it's like this is your thing I you know I just happened to be the guy that did it but you guys really got a hold of it and believed in something and like it, it, it started a culture of believing and winning well and kind of Fast forward to towards the end of your career, you know, what's, what's one of the hardest lessons you learned throughout playing baseball? One of the hardest things that I've learned? <clears throat> well, it's, uh, you, you know, I've, I mentioned before, like you think that, you think that it's going to keep on going. You know, it's like then you wake up one day and it's, you're not in the picture anymore. You know, one day a manager tells you, hey, you can pitch for me anytime. And then the next day, the manager's saying, hey, man, you ain't a starting pitcher anymore, <laughs> you know, so, you know, the reality of, you know, the reality of who you are and understanding when it's your time, the game lets you know, uh, sometimes guys take, you know, take too long figuring that out most of the time, and here's the thing, not every one of us had a, uh, I guess I'll mention a Yankee, a Derek Jeter, like, right, right off in a sunset kind of career, you know, if you, if you notice some of those big stars, they got every game they went to, everybody gave them a standing O, even the opposing uh, fans did, and that just doesn't happen. It's not storybook ending, you know. It's it's uh, you don't you don't go out the way you want to, and to, but to realize that, you know, and 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 not to hold on to something that ain't there anymore. And so for me, you know, baseball, there's a brutal truth to it, and it was a wonderful game, and I had a lot of fun doing it, and and, and most guys do, uh, but in the end, you know, it's just a it's just a season in your life, 
and it was just a season in my career, and now my career's done. But, uh, you know, it was to learn from the guys before me, to pass it on to the guys behind me. Um, matter of fact, some of the things that we, I, I coached at Mays High School uh, last year, we won the 5A state championship. We got some Mays High people in here, I saw. Um, but, you know, it's not really the things that, that I know, it's the things that I pass on. And it's, uh, so it's kind of fun to do that and just to see that transpire in the game as you, as you become this young hot dog prospect to, you know, a, a seasoned vet to a has-been <laughs> so, where people aren't collecting your baseball card anymore. Um, it's, uh, it's humbling, and that's good. That's really good. Well, so now you're, you're a business owner. So talk about, you know, the wing nuts. Why Wichita? Well, first of all, I got to tip my cap to Steve Root over there. That's the Kansas Baseball Hall of Famer over there. Um, <laughs> Steve Root is, a, he's actually um, a much smarter man than I am. Uh, we, he and I will both admit that our other partner with the wing nuts is way, like he's our brains, right, Steve? Um, but we, um, we chose this, all three of us, because we're Wichitans this home. And, you know, baseball is something we all loved and love being a part of. And, and coming back here, uh, you know, everybody knows the Wranglers left in 07 and there was a void. There was a void at the ballpark down there. And so, you know, to keep baseball alive, we had a group of guys come together and invest in a baseball team. And, you know, at the time for me, uh, you know, I wasn't around. It was more of a passive deal. And my brother, Josh, uh, was involved. My brother, Luke, was involved. And, uh, you know, Steve and all the rest of the team were, you know, keeping the fort, holding the fort down. But we love the game. And we love the city. And so that's why, that's why we did it. We didn't, we dang sure didn't do it to make money. And um, it's, uh, but, you know, to hear the stories, first of all, to keep the lights on for the last decade over there. Uh, and to hear the stories or see the players that come through there and have, have unbelievable stories to tell. Um, the stories that aren't told enough in this town, in my opinion. Uh, the stories that should be covered because this is our own. And I think that you've you got to take care of your own first. That's what I believe community is. Take care of your own first. And we had some guys that, like, people wouldn't know that the opening day starter for the Brewers this year was a Wichita wingnut. The opening day pitcher was a Wichita wingnut just four years ago, five years ago. And the starting uh, right field, left fielder for the Arizona Diamondbacks, David Peralta, same team. These guys never made it to the big leagues, but they played right here in Wichita, and they're in the big leagues. And by the way, we have a guy, and would love to bring him back. He's a, now a World Series champion, James Hoyt. He was a reliever on the Houston Astros that just won it this year. So... Many of you probably don't know those things because they're really, those stories aren't told enough. And there's some really great stories to tell because there's some really good baseball coming through over there. But we got behind that because we believed in it and we wanted, we wanted people to see a good product. We didn't do it, you know, we want, first of all, if we didn't do it first class, we weren't going to put our name on it, you know. And uh, we just invested in people uh, because we believed in them. And we wanted it to be something special for the city. And I, we feel like we've done a decent job. Well, and, and you came out of retirement with the Kansas Stars a couple of years ago, too. You know, talk about that experience and, and what came about with the Kansas Stars and really what it meant for the players that played with you. Yeah, you know, it, it goes back again to the love of the game. Um, it's, uh, you know, the, how special it was. And I've said this many times. And some of you guys have already heard it, but we had, I mean... If you threw me in, in a group of ex-ball players, I'm forgettable. Uh, unless you go to Detroit or maybe even here. Some of you probably don't even know me in the crowd here today, but um, that's okay. <laughs> uh, but we had, we had Chipper Jones here. He's the first ballot Hall of Famer, if you guys didn't just see that. And we had Roger Clemens, and we had Roy Halladay, and, his, and, and, and heartbreaking story with him. Um, but we had Hall of Fame baseball players playing right here at Lawrence Dumont Stadium. And these guys came here for nothing. And, and I always try to talk to people about uh, how special that is because they came here to come and play in meaningful games, to come back to the game they loved and play with guys and enjoy the game again, just the purity of the game. There was nothing that was, hand like none of these guys got appearance fees. And as, 
as forgettable as my career was, I'll just give you a, 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 like a rundown of what that looks like. Most teams, the Tigers, they, I just went to fantasy camp, which is a, another story we won't tell it today. In the word fantasy camp, okay, end it there. But they flew me down for this camp. They took care of all the bills, and they paid me, and they took care of my food. They took care of everything. And it's, and it's really difficult to get players to do that. Like, they just, they don't leave home. They just don't. And we had an assembly of really good ball players come to Wichita, Kansas. I was so proud of that, like, when I saw those guys get on that field. It was just one of the coolest moments that I've ever experienced in this town that peop, those guys would consider coming to our town. And it was, it was so unique. And it was, it was such a neat experience, and I hope, and I hope it happens again someday. But um, it, it'll never go away. They, that's something that can never be taken away from this town um, in baseball in Wichita. It's a, it's a really unique story. It was fun to watch most of the time. Um, we, <laughs> we had several guys blow out. We did. And uh, I was terrified to pitch. That was the first time I was terrified to pitch, by the way, because they were like, hey, you know, shouldn't you get out? This is your hometown. I was like, no. <laughs> There's, the, the best line that we had was, is there is a reason why we're retired. There's a reason why. If we were still good, we'd still be playing. So it was really actually terrifying to go out there and play. So kind of in that light, what can baseball do for a community? I think that uh, baseball is the fabric of a community. I think that um, if you go around... Town, if you want to get a comparable city to Wichita and its size and a minor league town, um, there's just a, there's a common ground about the game. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about baseball in particular, but sports in general. Is that, and this is why I want to, my son's going to do something. He doesn't love sports, but he's going to do something on a team. He's going to do something on a team, and this is why. Is that I learned in baseball that, you know, I played with guys from Venezuela and Japan, all over the world. United States, different, you know, United States can be a different world if you just cross a border. And, uh, but we had guys from different race, different religion, different social upbringing. Um, but we had all these guys, different, different uh, political views. But we all came together for one common goal. And that was the beauty of it. I didn't have to believe in what you believed in, but we worked together to achieve one common goal. And I love that about the game. I love that about the game. The baseball, the baseball clubhouse is a pretty diverse clubhouse. And, but the guys, when they come together, they're a team and they do it together. And it's one of the most beautiful things you could ever see. And so I love your hometown. I love baseball and I love what it does for a community because it teaches what's taught in that clubhouse about being a good team together. It teaches a community. Be a good team together. You know, uh, encompass all of that. Encompass the entire community. Don't be... You know, we always talked about um, a cancer in the clubhouse. If a guy was a cancer in the clubhouse, he was the guy that went over in his, into his uh, locker and he just sat by himself, put his headphones on, didn't talk to nobody. And, you know, if you think about that in community, if you have your little pockets of people that just go do their own thing and they don't embrace their community, then how's it going to get better? Because those cancers in the clubhouse, they made the team bad. They made the team bad. And so in a community, become part of a team. And so I think that's why baseball, and you know, especially baseball, um, I think that's it's very good for a community. And uh, you know, obviously, I don't. And baseball is not going to go away in Wichita. It's always going to be here. And so um, I just hope I can do my part, and uh, the organization, the Wingnuts, can do our part to uh, help that move forward in a, in a really good way. Um, I got my last question for you. Then we're going to open up to the crowd for a couple of from them. But so this room is full of entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs, business leaders, um, everybody in, in the community. So what's the one thing you want them to walk away with tonight? I'd say that I would say I would say three things. And, you know, I, I think we, we touched on perseverance. OK, life in general is set up for failure. It's not it's not a wonderful ride. We know that. Um, so, you know, when you get to those points uh, with what, whatever you're doing, whatever venture that you have, persevere. And learn how to persevere. Learn how to adapt to that. Um, another thing is, is that don't be complacent. And I, I have this saying that I always said, you're never right where you need to be. And I, I read that in a book one time, and so I just like, I grabbed onto it and it never left me. You're never right where you need to be. If you think you're right where you need to be, then you're not in a good place. You're never right where you need to be. There's always room for improvement. You can always grow. Um, and the other thing is listen. 
Um, my wife's sick tonight. Now I'm telling you guys, listening is a good thing. She would sit there and say, okay, yeah, you listen real good, guy. Um, but I learned that uh, and if you listen, uh, you know, and, and really, if you engage in somebody and you let them tell their story, I mean, man, you can, you can start a relationship immediately. You go tell your story right when you meet somebody, kinda, it's kind of a, it's a pushback. But listen, and, and I, I've learned that if I listen, when I do listen, that I can become a good teacher. So if I listen good, I can teach good. And so those are really the, the, the big three for me. Let's give Nate a round of applause. <laughs> if you have a question, raise your hand. Benny will uh, come over to the mic with you. Right up here in front. So you mentioned about uh, how a great team works. How, how are you able to take the baseball teamwork and apply it to Candle Club or your other endeavors? Well, you have to, um, more than anything else, is that I, you know, when, when I talk to people and when Judah and Steve talk to people, it's all about believing in whatever it is you're part of. And don't, like, it it's, it's happens too much where it's, it's a it's stop along the road for people you know, in their life, you know, whether it's a job at the Candle or an intern at, uh, with the Wingnuts or, you know, whoever it is coming through, if it's just a stop along the way, you're, not, you don't, you're probably not going to work out with us too well. If you believe in what we're doing and you want to be part of what we're doing and really believe it, like, you know, get a hold of it, embrace it, that's how you create a team because you'll find the people that gravitate to that and they will be successful. We have a lot of really good success stories that come out through there. Our, our GM today was an intern. How many? Ten years? How, ten years ago. Ten years ago. First, he was an intern. And my, my brother had a reason to fire him at one point and gave him another chance. And now he's our general manager. And he's a good one. Um, but he, he embraced what we were doing. And so, uh, you know, it's, if somebody just sees it as a stop along the way, it's not going to be a good team. It's not going to be. You got to believe in what you're doing. You got to be passionate about what you're doing. They got to see it, and and, that, and they can only see it from somebody that's showing them the way. And we have the people. It is, it's not me, and it's not Steve, but we have the people like Tyler here, um, that, and we have guys like Tim that walk along, and other people see that, you know, and then they gravitate to that, and it, and it just kind of it's it's uh, contagious. Who has a question for Nate? I know I do a great job explaining myself. Here we go. Another one up in the front. Um, you talked about being like um, having a Christian-based lifestyle. Do you think it's important to have a firm foundation when you're trying to persevere? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think that uh, it comes back to, um, I mean, everybody's, you stand on something, you know, everybody stands on something and whether it's a house of cards or a solid rock, you know, that's, that's two different things. And look, I'm going to tell you right now, I failed plenty and, you know, I try to learn from those things and even actions that I took or words that I spoke. And, um, I just, I try to be here. Here's, this is one of the things I do because people might think about like, you know, uh, you know, a faithful lifestyle, like you're, you're, you're trying to be perfect and I'm not perfect or whatever. It doesn't come down to that. What it comes down to, and I, and I love this about the game of baseball again, imagine that, is that consistency, when you get to the big leagues, you can make it to the big leagues, but they always say making it's one thing, staying is the big thing. And the only way to stay is if you're consistent. So that's like the way you, you live your life, you know, in the workplace and, and the life that you live is be consistent. You're going to screw up. But I just think about consistency because, you know, um, as long as you're consistent, then you're moving towards something, you know. And uh, that's, I guess that's the best way I can explain that. Straight back in the middle. So you've obviously found success as both a baseball player and an entrepreneur. Uh, which one of those has been more fulfilling for you personally, and can you tell us why? I would just say um, my investment in people has been the most fulfilling. Uh, you know, I went back, I told you about Fantasy Camp, and I, I hope you guys didn't get the wrong idea when I said fantasy. It's, uh, so Fantasy Camp is for, like, 
former, uh, their fans, their fans who pay money to come down and play games because they, you know, they always wanted to be a major leaguer. It's a neat thing. The reason I go back there is because of them, because they were the fans that came out and they were the ones that were passionate about the team. And so, like, when it comes to being an entrepreneur, like, being in business, it's the people. You know, getting around people and just interaction. That's what I love the most. That's why I go back with Detroit. Um, that's why I've spent, you know, time doing what I do around here. And, you know, one of the greatest things that we've done with the wing nuts is that we've, we've really embraced community more than ever. We will we'll come win baseball games and we, 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 we're a baseball organization, but that's not who we, who we are. Uh, what we've done the last couple of years. And if some of you have been to those, those concerts that we've had, we don't sell a concert when we go do these things. What we do is we sell what the purpose of what we're doing it for. And so what we've done is, is that, you know, I've, I've noticed that a lot of people come and they're, they, they're, Wichita's great, got great people, great causes, great events, great fundraisers, and, you know, everybody's always trying to do, do something for a good cause. Um, and there's a lot of asks, you know, like, my whole thing is, is that I don't mind the ask, because I, I, I don't mind giving, but I want something, I want the idea of what it looks like to be reciprocated. So what we've done with these concerts is we've really tried to embrace community, a lot of these nonprofits, and show them what, not that we came up with a concept, but just embrace, do our part in showing what like community does together instead of one-way streets. You know what I'm saying? Like one-way streets get tired. One-way streets get real tired. But if, if everybody's like kind of give and take, give and take, give and take, man, that creates a pretty cool place, you know? And so people, it's people. And that's what we, you know, I, I've enjoyed most about being in the game and out of the game. Our next question is in the back row on the left. I think you might be a Cardinals fan. <laughs> I see the red. Go, no, that's... go Cubs, go. I, <laughs> I just wanted to ask about what your vision for the future of baseball looks like in Wichita. Oh, man, I wish I had a crystal ball. Um, I just, uh, here's, here's what I think. I think that, um, that you really want to have, in order for baseball to work in a community, a town, you want to have a local connection. You want to have, you know, you want to have your homegrown people involved uh, somehow, some way, whether it's affiliated ball, independent baseball. Um, so, like I said before, baseball is going to be here. And the vision of the future of baseball professionally, it'll be in Wichita. One way or the other, it's going to be here. And I just think that, though, um, if you have, this is the only thing I'm opposed to. I'll just say this much. If you have an outside group, that basically, if you're enticing an outside group to come into Wichita, um, they're probably not going to move here. They're probably going to operate wherever they are from. Uh, the only thing that I can really see them getting excited about with Wichita is if, if it makes them money. That's it. Because I don't, I don't really see how they're waking up in the morning saying, man, I wonder how the economy in Wichita is doing today. Um, I just think that uh, I think you want to have in any in anything to do with this town, like you want to have local people invested in it, and that because they believe in it and they want to they want it to succeed. So they'll they'll put out the resources, the effort, and the energy to make it make it look good. So baseball will be fine. It'll be fine, and I I'm not the one in control of the decisions that are made, and I respect the decisions that are made. Way in the back on your left. Multi-part question. What do you think uh, is going on with the Shockers? How do you see their future in the AAC? And do Southern climate college towns have a distinct advantage over the Northern climate? So I think that uh, Todd Butler is a, he's an outstanding man if you had a chance to meet him. Um, and he, I believe he knows the game. Um, I believe he's trying to get his message across. And that's about all I can say about that at this point. And I think that they got, they got some really good ball players. They got some preseason, I think they got preseason All-American accolades. They're going to have a couple guys that can bang the ball around this year. They'll have a, they'll have a couple players that are real fun to watch. Now, going on to your second question, the ball player is not, we had a guy at Wichita State, and we always had the grinders. You know, those are the guys that I grew up with, the Eric Wedges and the Greg Brummets, like I said, just ball players, PJ Fours, Pat Mears, Darren Dreifert. Um, 
the ball player, the makeup of a ball player is much greater than the skill set of a ball player. And you can have all the skills in the world, but if you ain't a ball player, you ain't going to win. And one of the unique things that we get to do with Wichita, the wing nuts, is we get to bring our own players in. You know what we bring in? We bring in ball players. And if you're like a little prima donna and you're a cancer in the clubhouse, we say bye. And that's what I love about that. The southern schools, it didn't make, you know what? They had the, the SEC back then when we were at Wichita State. They had the, you know, ACC. They had the, you know, all the big, the big 12. And we mopped them guys up quite a bit because we were ball players. We might not have been as talented as them, but it's the mindset of the ball player. So I think that a lot of people get caught up in that, you know, the, the weather. And <laughs> we had a guy one time, and he said, man, I'm not a cold weather player. He said that at Wichita State. That, who do you think got ragged more than anybody else on that team? It was a cold day. He didn't want to play. He said, I'm not a cold weather player. And it's like, man, what? So we, we got on him a little bit. But it is a mindset. You know, the, and that's the thing I love best about being a coach at Mays. I don't, I don't really do, like, lessons with mechanics, like, you know, the five phases of pitching and hit, get your front arm up and all that stuff. Because mechanics, I mean, if you got it, you got it. I'll help out with them. But I love the mind. I love the mind, and, I, and the mind is very powerful, and not just in baseball, but in business, too. All right, we got one more question here in the middle. I love your concept of ball player, and as you compare your time as an athlete to your time as an entrepreneur, how do folks in business spot a ball player? Hmm. How do they pick and surround themselves with ball players in the world of business as opposed to the world of sports? I think you can look at somebody in the eye in a five-minute conversation and find that out. You ask the questions that you want to ask, you have the conversation that you want to have, and you can find out real quick. And this, I think it's just discernment, in, in my opinion. Um, you know, first time I met Jake, you know, this guy, he's got a, he's got a passion for I've talked, you know, we talked for a little bit the other day, but, I, you know, we were linked in, I think, first, and then we had a couple emails but when I talk to him, I can see the passion and what he's doing and why he's doing it. It didn't take long. I figured it out because he cares. And caring, you know, it goes back to that, you know, just having a heart for something and caring about it, you know, and, and not just, it's just not another step along the road, you know. And I see that with a lot of young people today, it's, it's discouraging. Um, they go to university and they get out and they just want that first job and then they want to go. You know, it's like, eh, that's not a good foundation. We got we to gotta work on that. So, um, but you can, I, I, that's the only way I could explain it, personally. I don't, I don't have another explanation for it other than just, I normally say in about a five-minute conversation, I can find out where you're at, you know, being a ball player or not, you know, in the business world. So, and I'm not the smartest tool in the shed. <laughs> Sharpest, see? I can't even say the right word. Well, let's give Nate a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.